The Halloween season is the perfect time of year to listen to the haunting sounds of Opeth, and those Swedish boys are at their spooky best whenever they turn off the distortion and pick up some grandpa's guitars. The song Closure off the band's Damnation record is a perfect example of this with its blend of hauntingly beautiful chords and super spooky riffs. So on today's video we're going to do a riff by riff breakdown on this song and find out exactly what makes it tick. The guys and ghouls, it's your good buddy, Uncle Ben Eller. So fun story, this is actually my third swing at recording this video for you guys. The first time that I filmed the entire lesson video, I stood up and realized that I had never turned my microphone on to begin with. I tried going in and dubbing the entire thing for you guys, but it ended up kind of like this. I have a guitar, it goes like this. Do, do, do. And then yesterday I tried filming it again and there was a ton of construction going on outside of my window, so the video sounded kind of like this. But you know what they say, third time's the charm, right? No. No. In 2003, Opeth released their Damnation record, which is the band's first foray into a more melodic, less brutal sound for the band. Kind of ushered in the current wave of the shag carpet era of Opeth that we've been living in for the past 10 years or so. And it is an awesome record full of great production, really memorable solos, and of course a ton of super beautiful and haunting riffage. And I think the song Closure off of that record is a perfect example of that. And as always, full tabs for this lesson as well as a bevy of backing tracks, bonus lessons, and so much more are available to everybody who supports my channel over on my Patreon page, patreon.com slash benellerguitars. For even just the low, low price of one dollar a month, you get access to all the goodies. Be sure to check it out and sign up today. Gear-wise in this video, I'm using my lovely Mark an SC13E acoustic here that I just got recently that I'm totally in love with using Dunlop picks and strings and I'm running this into the Fractal Audio Axe FX3 for some added reverb and ambiance. I had planned on using this DoD grunge pedal but it made my guitar sound like a pile of shit, so I'm not using it. Snag yourself a great deal on this stuff as well as other things that are nice by clicking the Sweetwater affiliate link in the video description below. The song kicks off with a jangly 12 string chord progression. Let's check it out. So the first chord here is a big old D5. It's just a D power chord in two octaves. That means we got root fifth, root fifth, or D, A, D, A. So after you strum through that, we're gonna start diddling around on that high string. So you can see I took the high fifth that we had there, the A note, and I knocked it down a half step to G sharp. Now what you're gonna do is you're gonna go from that note, then back up, then back down, and then you're going to open that string up so it's the open high E. This is like a D sus2 at this point. Now that sharp fourth that we had in there is very indicative that these chords were built out of the Lydian scale. Which is just like a major scale, only with a raised fourth. We're going to talk about that scale a couple other times throughout this song, but this is something that Opeth does all the time. They don't really like to use standard major scales or standard minor scales. They like the ones that have like a little tweak to them that make them sound just a little bit more ear-catching. Then we get to this section right here. 
Okay, so you can see I've got the D and G held down here on fret number two. I'm strumming my A, D, and G strings through here. But if you get a little extra off of your B or E strings, that's okay too. Now, whenever we start this off, this is once again just an A power chord. Root fifth, root. It's not major, it's not minor. Then you're gonna move that G string up here to fret number five. That's a C note, which in reference to A is a flat third. So now our chord is root fifth, flat third. In other words, the voicing of an A minor chord. Then take that note down a half step. This is now a sus two chord, and then back to where it started. I've noticed that live he plays this section a little different. He plays it like this. Kind of more like one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, and timing wise. Maybe it's just easier for him to play that and sing it at the same time. I'm not really sure, but on the album it sounds like. And then we're gonna go to this voicing. So you'll notice right there I led into that by hitting the E note on the D string that I was already holding down from my previous chord. And then I went to this right here. So this has got the 3rd D, 2nd G, 3rd B, and the open high E. It gives us F, A, D, E. Fade, if you will. Now, there's a couple different ways you could think about this chord. You know, you could think of it as being an F type chord that has root, 3rd, 6, and 7. Kind of like an F major 7 with an added 6 in there. Another way to think of it would be to think of it like a D minor chord that has its flat 3rd in the bass root, flat third, fifth, ninth. So it'd be like a D minor add nine kind of sound. Either way, that's a cool thing about like learning about chords and harmony and stuff like this. You could look at it any number of different ways and turn it into different chords. It just depends on who you're calling the root, you know? On the repeat, the only thing that we're gonna change is instead of going to that D sus two at the end, it's just gonna be a regular D major. You can see I'm doing that with the bar of the first finger. It makes it a little bit easier when you've just come off of playing this stuff. So now that Michael conjured up some prettiness with those chords, he's gonna counter that with some ugliness and weirdness in this next part, which has some really spooky sounding chords in it that I love. Let's check it out. So the first run that we have here starts off with A and then B. Then you're gonna go to this mysterious grip. So all that I'm doing here is holding down the first A and the second D, and then I'm using the open G and B strings. Really weird sound, right? We'll talk about what that chord might be here in just a second. Then what you're gonna do is slide in to the sixth fret on the A string, that's your E flat note. And the other notes you're gonna hold down for this chord grip are gonna be your fifth fret D string. Open G, open B, and then you're seven on the high E. Really strange sound, right? And then you gotta play this little figure on the bottom strings. So that started off as like an E sus two. Then I'm gonna flatten that fifth out. Add in my middle finger here on the second fret low E, and then take it back off. Okay, so it's like this. love that part. Now this first chord that we have right here, again there's a lot of different ways you could think of it. To me the first thing that I thought about whenever I played it is it feels like my regular E minor grip. Only the note that's the usual fifth, the B right here, is moved down a half step. So it's kind of like an E minor that has a fifth, there's your B note, and a flat fifth, the B flat right there. That's that evil tritone interval. Automatically sounds really scary. You could also think about this as being some kind of a B-flat chord. This gets really confusing because it'd have B-flat, it's flat fifth, which is E, it's, uh, what would that be, six, which is G, and then it's flat nine, which would be B. Might be part of that greater altered dominant sort of family because there's a lot of weird things that you can kind of chuck into that folder. If it's a weird chord, it's probably an altered dominant. Um, this could probably fit into that. But this chord right here, this is an unusual one. So, if you think of E flat as the root, G is going to be your third. There's another G note, just doubled up. And then this B note right here, 
would sound out as a raised fifth to E flat, okay? Now, those three notes, E flat, G, and B, which we also get right here on the high E string in that group, that's a root note, the note a major third above it, and then the note a major third above that one. That's the formula for what we refer to as an augmented chord. Root, major third above that, major third above that, another major third above that, lead you back to the root again. Really unusual sounding chords. I think a lot of rock and metal guys think of like diminished chords as being the scary ones, but oftentimes an augmented chord in the right spot, like we have right here, can sound extremely weird on its own. After they play through that a couple times, we have this little ending section. So this starts off with another A power chord, root fifth root. Then what you're gonna do is to take that middle finger and move it up here to the A string, fret number two. Now we have B, D, and A. I would kind of think of that as being like a miniature B minor seven voicing. Just a good old C triad right there. And then we're gonna play some octaves. Now, I'm using those with the open low E string right here. So when we hit this D sharp, it sounds really dissonant, right? Notice too, I'm muting out the D string here. I'm not letting that ring. Be sure to use that flattened first finger to play that octave without the D string ringing out on you. Strike that, and strike it again, up to that E note on the seventh fret. That transition leads us into one of my favorite parts of this song, this super exotic, weird, kind of jam session that they have in the middle. I love how long they stay on this and how they build it up with all the uh, hand drums and percussion and that haunting melody. It sounds like probably like an ebo on an electric guitar or something like that going on with those really long sustaining notes. I love this section. It's pretty hard to play, or at least it used to be until I saw exactly the way that Michael himself picks through one of these licks that's in it. I'll show you guys what I'm talking about. As well as break down the super interesting exotic scale that makes the latter half of this riff tick. Again, it's so cool sounding and we have this contrast here between the first chords which aren't too strange, and then the super weird back half of the riff. Now to start off with, I'm using this grip. You can see how I'm using my first finger here to bar the A, D, and G on fret number two, and then I'm extending my little finger out here onto the D string fret five. After that, I'm gonna have this series. So I'm still doing the bar here on the second fret, and again, extending the little finger out so he's on the fifth A, then my ring finger on the fourth A. That gives us the sound of an A sus4 to A major kind of triad with the fourth and third in the bass. So you'll remember earlier in the video how I said that Opeth likes to use common scales, like major scales and minor scales, but with one little tweak to make them sound a little bit more interesting. This session is a perfect example of that because if you looked at the sum total of all those notes, you could figure out that it's based on the E Dorian scale. Now the thing that made your ears perk up a little bit when you heard that is that it's almost a regular minor scale, a sound that we all have pretty well internalized by this point. It's the sad scale, right? The Dorian scale, though, is just one note off from that, and instead of featuring the normal sixth note, which would be a C note, it features a raised six, or a C sharp note. That makes all kinds of cool things possible. I did a whole lesson about the Dorian mode itself and all the cool chords and things you can get out of it, so be sure to search for that on my channel. I think it's called Everything Dorian or something like that. You'll find it. So after all that business, we're gonna play this. So that was me sliding into the E note on the A string, hitting the open low E, and then we're gonna hit the D sharp note on fret number six and slide back into E. That way you can play this voicing. Now this is where things start getting really interesting, because I've got root, another root, a major third here on the D string, and then I'm using my open G string. Now, if we're thinking of E as the root note here, this is really strange, because this has a major third, the happy sound, and a flat third, or minor third, the sad sound, right? See, with chords, we really hear their quality, their happiness or their sadness, based on that third. An E major sounds like this, 
one note off and it becomes minor. That one note that I changed was the third. So whenever we have chords like this, that have both the happy note and the sad note, it's really confusing to our ears. It's like we don't really quite know how to process that. And this is a trademark that Opeth does all the freaking time. They do this all over their music and it's so mysterious and haunting sounding, you know? You'll notice there is another kind of slide out then back onto that major third right there. Be sure to let those open strings ring out while you play that too, before you play this. So that's sliding down here to the F note, two of the root notes, hammering back into the F note, okay? Play it one more time. Then we have this thing. Okay, this is really cool. Check this out. E, hammering onto B flat, the tritone. Gotta play the C sharp note right here on the A string. Open D string. Then just go back through the A and E strings. Again, let those ring into each other. So this section, it's easy to look at this and go, oh, he just hit all the ugly notes. Major third, minor third, flat fifth, flat nine, like all the really aggressive sounding intervals. It's easy to look at this and go, oh yeah, he just picked the ugly stuff and played that. And maybe he did. From what I understand about Michael Ockerfeld, he's not like a super theory buff kind of guy. Like he doesn't know a ton about scales and what kinds of chords he's playing and everything. He just has a really twisted ear that leads him towards this stuff. But that doesn't mean that there's not a greater explanation in the realm of theory to explain why this sounds so weird and where it comes from. Because check this out. The sum total of notes that we have in there spells out a really interesting scale that I find is extremely underutilized. I'm actually planning on doing a whole video about how like every metal player should be using this scale right now. Because if you look at all the intervals that are in there, root, flat nine, flat third, regular third, flat five, uh, I don't remember if there's a fifth in there, but I'll pretend that there is. The natural six. All these things nearly spell out the half-hold diminished scale. And if you don't know what that is, it's actually one of the easiest scales to grasp because all you do is start off on a note like E, and then plays a series of half-step and whole-step all the way up. Check it out. Root note, half-step, whole-step, half-step, whole-step, half-step, whole-step, half-step, whole-step. The symmetry of that scale means that it doesn't really have much of a tonal center. Like whenever you play a major scale, when you hit that E note, it really feels like you crossed the finish line and you've gone full circle around the scale and now you're back at home base and everything's all jolly again. But with symmetrical scales, it doesn't really sound like there's any kind of home base to it. It just sounds like it keeps going and going and going. like where does that thing stop or end, right? So whenever you take that scale and form chords and things around it, that's how you can get that weird dissonance of having major third and minor third, because that scale has major third and minor third. Having that flat nine in there as well. Again, super creepy, aggressive sounding intervals that are all waiting for you right there in that scale. Now that last little roll that we have in there, let's talk about that. I used to have the hardest time playing this back in the day because I would try to sweep it. Try to go like down, hammer, down, up, up, up. So it's down, hammer, down, up, up, up. Um, I could do it slowly and I could do it really fast, but the problem is playing it at like the medium tempo that that riff is played at because your hand can just blow through the strings faster than you'd ever need it to, right? So I watched Michael play this live and he does it like this. You'll see that was more like a cross-picking approach, like how a bluegrass player or like Steve Morris would do it. I'm doing a downstroke, doing a hammer-on. On the A string, I'm going to do another downstroke. Explain that in a second. Up on the D, down on the A, up on the E. So it's down, hammer, down, up, down, up. Now that's not true alternate picking, right? Because otherwise I'd be going down, up, down, up, down, or something like that. The way that I think of this is that the hammer on is buying the time that an upstroke usually would. Down, up, down, up, down, up. Whenever
whenever you play it that way, it has you ending on an upstroke, which means you're going to be ready to restart the riff on a downstroke. So it's like rhythmically correct to skip that upstroke. So I noticed that whenever I started playing that the way that Michael does, I was able to keep my timing much more even. After the exotic jam session concludes, we're back to a solo guitar and vocals playing these chords. Check them out. So right out of the gate right there, we have another chord that I would hear as being like a Lydian sort of voicing. We've got root, we've got root again, there's that sharp fourth that the Lydian scale has. The B string open would sound out as a ninth, and the high E string would sound out as your fifth again. Cool chord. Now the next one. a stark shift to a more minor tonality because he brings in this C note here, the flat third. Now the first chord grip is the Metallica Call of Cthulhu chord grip, if you know that one here. Root, root, flat third, hence the minor kind of sound. Our B string sounds out as a ninth. That rubs really nicely against that flat third in there. Really haunting sound. Then your high E would sound as a fifth to that chord. Now the next move you're going to take this middle root note that you're holding down, move it down a half step. This enters into that like minor, major, seven, add nine kind of turf. Really scary sounding chords, I love these. And then this move. So you can see I've still got the C note held down from before, but now I'm also grabbing this F sharp note on the D string. So the D string in these chords has gone from A to G sharp to F sharp. And the scale that contains those cool intervals of root, major 7, and major 6 is going to be your A melodic minor scale. Root, 2nd, flat 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, root. And again, you can look at that and say that's just like a major scale, only with a flattened 3rd note. That's why I think about melodic minor. I don't think of it as being a minor scale. I think of it as being a major scale with one note that got shifted over. The third is now a flat third. This is an interesting one because having that flat third in there, again, the third kind of determines the flavor of the chord, so to speak. So having that flat third makes you think this whole scale is minor, but so many of the other intervals in there are more like things that you'd find in a major scale. Really interesting sound. So as we play through those parts right there, we're getting a little bit of taste of Lydian, then the melodic minor scale. We're gonna play this figure that centers around E. So this is E, and then I'm gonna hit the B string as well as the second fret high E. And you can see right there, that was a little hammer on, pull off, and then pull off to open. B E, okay? Sounds like E minor at that point. And then so you can see right there, I hit the D sharp note on the B string, bent it up a half step, E, B, and G. Again, I've also seen Michael cross pick through those. And then, we got a couple little octaves right here. This is F, sliding down to E, and then a couple more strums on it. And it just starts over. So it just continues through that chord progression a couple of times there with that shifting tonality of A Lydian to A melodic minor, to more of an E minor sound at the end right there, until we reach the outro, which is another long extended exotic jam. Let's check it out. Love this part, it's so exotic sounding, and again, it's a really strange mix of intervals that we find in major scales and in minor scales, which I think is what makes it so hard for our ear to pin down 
how we should feel about this section. Now you'll notice for pretty much all of it, I'm playing octaves on the A and G strings. So I'm muting out that D, you know, using the uh, inside of my first finger right there. We don't want to hear that string at all. I'm also strumming the open low E, as well as the open B and E strings. You get that nice jangly kind of sound. So you'll notice the octaves start off here on E. Goes down a half step to D sharp, kind of like a major scale would, right? Down to the fifth, B. Then what it's going to do is to take itself back up to D, which is a flat seven. Again, scales don't usually have a root, a major seven, and a flat seven, and that kind of chromaticism isn't something that nature favors in scales. But by doing this mix of happy sounding major stuff and sad sounding minor stuff, this is how Opeth creates this confusing sound. That was just a slide back up to root and back down to fifth. Then we're going to move the octaves down here to the bottom strings. So at this point, I'm muting the A and the G using the underside of my third finger. So all that we're hearing is E string, D string, B string, E string. Pretty sure they play these with the open strings jangling on top like what I'm doing. I might be wrong though. There's a lot going on on this outro. There's a lot of layers of guitars and 12 string and stuff like that. So a little hard to say, but that's how I'm playing it. If it doesn't sound right to you, just play the octaves and that's fine. Now right here we're starting off on B flat, the flat five, the tritone, so it sounds really mean. Down here to the flat third, kind of indicating a minor scale or maybe a low green scale. Slide back up to the fifth, and then check this move out. So this is a G, and then I gotta play this lick. This is E, C sharp, G, and C sharp. Again, kind of indicative of that. Dorian scale again for just a second. And then this little deal right here on the low E. Obviously it's just E and F. So you got the E's. Moving down to the bottom. And that is every chord and lick in this Opeth Classic. Again, I hope that teaches you guys a little bit about the kind of scales and chords and things that Opeth uses in their music. It's one thing just to learn a song and know how to play the licks and everything, but I think whenever you take things a step further and analyze them harmonically and intervallically like what we did today, then you really learn what makes it tick. You know, you learn that this combination of major and minor third is what makes that sound so accurate and dissonant. So the next time that you're writing some stuff, maybe you use that combination of intervals in your own playing to make something that sounds really haunting and devious like what Opeth did. Thank you guys so much for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe to my channel for new content coming at you every single week. Be sure to ring the bell for notifications every time I upload a new slice of fried gold. If you like this video and want to say thanks, be sure to consider supporting my channel over on patreon.com slash benellerguitars, where even just for a dollar a month, you'll get access to all kinds of cool stuff. Well, guys, it's been fun as always, but I got to get off here and go teach some Skype lessons. But as for you guys, I recommend that you get away from the computer, pick up your guitar, and go play a little bit. Less clicking, more picking.